This is a really interesting update year for Photoshop Camera Raw Lightroom because usually when Adobe updates any of those programs, Lightroom Classic, Lightroom Desktop, and Photoshop Camera Raw, they're on par with each other, okay? Sometimes there's minor differences between the two, but generally the features that are in Lightroom Classic and are in Lightroom are in Adobe Camera Raw. But this time, October of 2024, in these updates, we've got some pretty major changes to Adobe Camera Raw that are not inside of Lightroom Classic or Lightroom Desktop, okay? So, and in fact, I would say out of all of the updates, out of all the videos I've done and all the, the new features and whatnot that have changed here, I would say my favorite feature in this entire fall update is inside of Camera Raw. It's something that I use all the time. It's the first feature that we'll cover here. But just to reiterate as we jump in here, what you're about to watch the only feature that's the same inside of Lightroom is gonna be the generative remove or generative erase feature. That's the only feature of everything you're about to watch that is also inside of Lightroom. Everything else that you're gonna see here as of right now, October of 2024, is only gonna be inside of Adobe Camera Raw. Let's jump in. So I've got a couple of photos open in to Adobe Camera Raw. So we'll, we'll demo with these two ver versions. We got some wildlife, got a landscape in here. Uh, first things first is you, you gotta, gotta make sure this is on. So when I first got to this, I opened it up and none of these features were available to me, even though I do have the new version, which is Camera Raw 17 or above. Come to this gear icon at the top right, click on the gear icon, go to technology previews, and you gotta make sure that checkbox is turned on, new AI features and settings panel. Uh, just as a public service announcement, if the tool tips that pop up in a camera raw annoy the living daylights out of you as they do me, always go to general, turn those off. That's not a new feature, but they just kind of annoy me. So you might get annoyed by them as well. Uh, my first feature is, is probably my favorite one and that's gonna be denoise, okay? So we'll go down here to the detail panel. So before this update, denoise was, was what it does is it, number one, it forces you to choose a level of denoise, all right? It forces you to do that, and then it makes a copy of the photo. It automatically and has to make a copy of, of your raw photo as a DNG, okay? That wasn't an option for you. Now, when you go to the detail panel, you turn on this little checkbox and it's now applying the denoise for you on the same photo, okay? I don't know, necessarily know that it's any faster, but it's definitely going to be easier this way. And you're gonna see why in a second, but I'm just gonna make sure I fast forward through the rest of this because it does take a minute. Now, once it's done, here's the differences that you're gonna see. First off, you're gonna see a little adjustment slider here. This is what we were forced to choose a number on before. And let's go ahead and zoom in on the photo here. You can get a look. In fact, I'll turn, I'll turn detail off just so you can see ISO 2000. It wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, the, the noise wasn't horrible. Uh, ISO 2000 on a good camera, it still looks okay, but we definitely want to do a little bit of noise reduction on it, okay? So the first thing is you were forced to choose this number before, okay? It's nice to be able to go back. So they're calling it non-destructive denoise. It was always in a way non-destructive because it did make a DNG copy of your photo. You could always go back to the raw photo and you could start the process over again. It was a little bit annoying to do it that way. Um, this isn't as big for me as it might be for some people. I always settled somewhere between 60 and 70 and I just left it there and I never cared much to change it. It worked well for, for my photography, but it is nice to be able to go back and change it anytime you want now, because if I close this photo and I open it back up, the same settings will appear to me and I'll be able to change this however many times that I want. But the big thing is, is it now doesn't make a duplicate copy Okay, if you take a look, we are still editing the same original raw photo. It didn't make a duplicate copy of it. And that's huge because I've got all of these, you know, full resolution, very, very large DNG files floating around my computer because now I've got my original raw file and then I got my DNG file that went along with it. And I don't know about you, I'm not always really good about remembering to go delete those things. So, um, it's just a lot easier this way. Probably, I would say for me as a wildlife photographer that really enjoys wildlife, I'd say probably one of the uh, the biggest features in this update for you, okay? Moving on down the line. So now we also have generative expands. So let's switch to a different photo here. 
I'm just gonna click auto just to do some quick edits to it. We'll head over to the crop tool and you need to first enable expand at the top there. Now it gives you these little crop handles. And what you would do is drag it outside of the boundaries of what your photo boundaries normally exist. Okay, so it's not gonna work inside the photo, it's gotta go outside of the photo. And then down at the bottom or in the middle bottom area, you see a little generate. So you can click on that and it's going to generate an area for that. It is still fairly low resolution, but all generative AI across the board is, is still low resolution at this point. Um, so now it depends what you're doing with the photo, right? If you're putting it on Instagram, I don't, nobody's going to know what I just did to that photo. You can't see it. You can't see the low resolution version of it. If you wanted to put it on a four or five K a web gallery, that's going to be seen on a four or five K computer screen. Yeah. When you start to zoom in, you can start to see that low resolution area over there. Of course, for print, that's not going to work. So just keep in mind, it's got its audience. Most people, whether you like it or not, you might be somebody that prints, but most, you know, your majority of people don't print and don't need high resolution photos. They're just putting this stuff on social media and at these posted stamp sizes that Instagram on your phone shows, uh, this will work out just fine. But got a, a very quick word from our sponsor. So you're watching a video on Photoshop. If you're interested in learning more on Photoshop, I've got two big courses that are on sale right now that I encourage you to check out. Uh, my Photoshop system is for beginners. It's for people that want to tackle Photoshop and just want the stuff for photographers because there's so much in Photoshop we only need to know about 10% of it. And uh, that's what my Photoshop system does. It goes from the ground up for layers, selections, brushes, tools, filters, um, retouching, lots of projects inside of there. So that's a really good place as a beginner. If you really want to final ta finally tackle Photoshop, that's a great place to go. If you're a little bit further down the road, you understand layers, you understand some of the basic tools, how to brush, how to make basic selections, then my Photoshop How To course is the place to go. Keeps you from searching around the internet to find fragmented tutorials that all teach you different ways to do things. Uh, you get a very nice, cohesive way of learning the most important how to's in Photoshop. All very approachable, all very affordable, easy to watch, and uh, are on sale on the website right now. So, encourage you to swing by. And if you do purchase right now, um, you, you pretty much have your updates. Uh, people always ask me, are these courses updated? As you'll notice in these Photoshop features, they're just tiny tweaks to existing tools. So I will update the courses within the next couple of weeks. You'll get that for free automatically. But as a whole, I would encourage you for me or for anybody out there, don't let that hold you back. Photoshop has not changed. It's the same program that it was a few years ago with a couple minor tweaks in there. So the foundations and all those things that we use all the time, they haven't changed. So I think it's still 100% applicable. Let's get back to the tutorial. All right, moving on down the line. Now we've go over to switch back to this photo here. So the other one's going to be your generative erase. So we'll head over to the erase tool. A couple things you're going to see different here. Number one, it's, it's not necessarily new. We did get this about halfway through the year in 2024. We got this generative erase inside of Lightroom and Camera Raw. Number one, it's got better models, it's better. Number two, the detect objects, it's better at detecting the objects. It's also got a little bit of an add subtract area that you'll see in just a second. But there's another, I'm gonna give you a little tip that goes along with this one. And that is, notice how it showed me the rest of the photo. Right? When I look at the photo in the regular edit panel, you can tell I had cropped the photo. If I were to go to the crop tool, you can see I cropped the photo. So when I look at it there, you can see the cropped version. When I go to generative race, it leaves this here. So here's a little tip for you is if I were to try to remove the bear on the cropped photo, and I'm just going to outline and I've got detect objects turned on. So all I really need to do is I don't even really need to outline it. We're just going to kind of scribble over it and see how good of a job it does. So it does a, a nice job there. We do get these little add subtract buttons. If you want to subtract the keyboard shortcut, it's also instead of clicking the button, option key on Mac, alt key on PC. So I'll go in there and subtract. It doesn't have to be as close. And I would say, don't bring it right up to the edges, but also don't leave too much room. All right, let's go and add that little section inside of there. So what would happen if I didn't see this extra area? And if you're wondering why is it showing it to me, if I just removed this and left this because it was part of the, the cropped photo, it would usually try to fill it with another bear. 
Okay, so there's there was some tricks that we had to go through to try to get generative erase to work inside of Lightroom and Camera Raw. But now when you see that extra area, you go in there and remove it. And I'll just click on remove here. Now, because we're able to select and, and grab that entire bear, it usually does a really good job of removing it. You also get a couple of variations. Again, this isn't necessarily new. This has been around for a while. Uh, it is better and the detect objects works a little better along with the ability to add and subtract uh, from it as well. Okay. As always, it's generative. It's still going to be low resolution, but because I did it on the background, you're not going to see as much of that. Okay, because it's a it's a low resolution, it's a it's a blurry background. Um, that's usually when I try to use this stuff, and I'm able to get away with it on a high resolution photo. It's because I generally try to use it on parts of the photo that are not high resolution, or don't appear to be high resolution. I switch over to a different photo here, and we'll take a look. So again, I'll just go, just scribble over that and see how it does. Didn't grab the whole thing, so I can add to it hit remove again, does a nice job. And because it's water, uh, because it's not, oh, it didn't do a good job this time. Let's see what the variations look like. I practiced it before and it did a nice job, but that looks pretty good. Again, because it's water, it's not a very high resolution area. I could even zoom into that a little bit and, and you're not gonna see it in there. It's just those detailed areas like the trees and some of the grass that uh, we'd have a little bit of problem with that generative uh, fill and generative AI technology. The last one's gonna be in our regular edit panel, and it's gonna be under the profile section. So let's go to, let's go to, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it on this photo here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reset all of my light adjustments in here. So we've had profiles for a while. We've had browse to where we could import and use other profiles as well. But now you're gonna see Adobe Adaptive Beta at the top. What this is, is it's an adaptive profile, okay? A profile sits on top of all of your edits. So if you're using a profile as a better starting place, it would be the first thing that you wanted to do to the photo. Sometimes people use a profile as a, almost a creative adjustment. And that's something that you could do at the end if you wanted to. But if you're using it as a better starting place, you'd wanna do it first, because it, it does sit on top of all your, your edits and you can't use two profiles, so you gotta choose before or after. But it sits on top of all the edits. It's giving you a better starting place. And then your all of your light settings here are gonna generally work a little bit different now because you applied this profile to the photo. So to me, it made it too bright. So I'm gonna back off on the exposure a little bit, but you'd still go down here and you'd still adjust your light settings. It's giving you what, what profiles always did is give you a different starting place for the photo. This is just adaptive in that it's looking at the tones in your photo, the highlights, the shadows, the midtones, and it's adapting a profile to that. So when you apply it to one photo, it's gonna be different than if you applied it to another photo. I find on bright photos like this, I don't get the best results, but I do get some really good results on a lot of landscape photos. So it's worth trying out. It's, it, it doesn't hurt you. Just give it a try, click on it and see if you like the results. You're still gonna have to go and edit after the photo, but your editing will respond a little bit differently. Um, on this photo, I found, let's, I'll go ahead and reset the light settings here. And just that's the option Alt key, uh, hold that down and then that'll bring up reset on every panel there for you. And then I'll go to adaptive. So it is giving me a contrastier, more colorful version of the photo that I can then go in here and start to adjust if I want to. Okay. Now, the thing about the adaptive profile is it's really meant to go hand in hand. Don't, don't, don't feel off if you go to this and you're not seeing a big difference in your photos and it's not changing your photo editing because it's, it's really not going to. It's mostly meant to go hand in hand with the HDR feature that came out last year, okay? It's meant to go hand in hand with that. And the problem is, is that you may have a screen that can display HDR to you, but the rest of the world can't see it, okay? So I just clicked on it and it's not gonna come across the same to you. You're, you're not gonna see what I see. I see an expanded range down here. Um, I'm able to pull back these sides. I see so much more detail down here. It's not gonna necessarily translate to the video here. I'm gonna actually click on it on this photo here. To me, the, it's so weird because this photo to me is night 
and day when I turn HDR on. Try this on your own photos. If you have an HDR monitor, you might have to go to the manufacturer and look it up to see if you do. I see so much more cloud detail. I see so much more shadow detail. And the best I can explain it to you, I'm gonna hop over to Photoshop. And so let's go ahead and uh, let's just uh, cancel out of here. I'm gonna hop into Photoshop. This HDR feature, so difficult to explain. It's meant for HDR monitors. It's meant for HDR output. It's just Instagram, all these different places that you're sharing screen captures, video captures like this, they can't see it. So the best I can explain is, here is the non-HDR version of this photo. Here is the HDR version of, the, of this photo. This HDR version looks so much worse to you, doesn't it? It looks horrible. It looks all blown out. It looks overexposed. It's here. Guys, when I clicked on this HDR version of the photo inside a camera raw and I did it, I didn't want to go back. It brought all, all the blue in the sky up here. There was so much detail in the foreground here. I can't explain it to you. And that's why I'm encouraging you to try it on your own, even though nobody else will be able to see it at this point. Okay, so, um, but it's cool. You can edit this way. You can do all this stuff this way. Just know that when you save it as a JPEG and put it on most of your online websites and whatnot, other people are not going to be able to see it. I love the technology. I love where it's going. I think it'll go to great places. We're just not quite there yet, but it is worth experimenting with. Uh, lastly, so everything I just went over here is inside of Adobe Camera Raw. There is, of course, the full Photoshop main interface, and I did a separate video on that on all of the new features. So if you're looking for a video to go to next, that's probably a good place to go.